I'm really gonna go through. Five country close up for nine eighteen seventy nine. I think we're seeing a shift of pe from people using credit only to purchase durable goods to a use of credit for current consumption. I think um, there are probably many dozens of bookmakers operating in Polk County, and I don't think it would take too much difficulty for anyone who seriously wants to place a bet to locate such a person. Nobody to talk to, like when something happens to one of the kids. You don't have anybody to share what has happened with, you know, you, you can't talk to anybody about it. You have to make the decision by yourself. I'm Charlene Peroni. I'm Bob Pyle. I'm Twyla Young, and this is Five Country Close-Up's News Magazine program. Tonight we'll look at gambling, legal and illegal, in the Hawkeye State and the growing number of single parents. First, a peek inside our wallets and bank accounts. Twyla? Do you use credit cards regularly? Do you owe money to a bank or a savings and loan or a credit union? Do you owe more money than you wish you did? Well, if you do, you have a lot of company. Bank card division, Mrs. Okay. Lori. Okay, can I have your account number, ma'am? Okay. This is the customer service center at the Master Charge Visa Department at the Iowa Des Moines National Bank. By one estimate, the Iowa Des Moines handles as much as 70% of Iowa's Master Charge business directly or through its correspondent banks. That's hundreds of thousands of households and millions of dollars. How many cards and how much money, the folks at Iowa Des Moines won't say, but nationwide, bank card holders charge some $60 billion worth of goods and services every year. Owing all that money may have sounded downright awful a few years ago, but financial advisors say that using credit these days makes sense for some pretty solid reasons. In essence, the fact that we have inflation reduces what we call the real cost of using credit. You're repaying with depreciating dollars, and that's to the debtor's advantage. And then secondly, there are tax incentives. The interest paid on debt is tax deductible versus the interest that you earn on savings is taxable income. The biggest change that credit cards have wrought in our money management is the disintegration of the notion that you have to save up to buy something big. Well, you can use them a lot more if you don't have the cash right on hand. You can, you know, if you can't afford it, you can put them on cash and make payments on it. So it's a lot easier to obtain things. Probably most often that we use it is when, oh, there's sales and uh, we want to buy in quantity and uh, feel that we're getting a good price at the time, and that helps us. A bank credit card is a short-term revolving credit, and it's designed to supply the consumer with the ability to purchase at those times where his, his cash supply is short. Now, in that environment, we would like to see most of our customers use the, the credit line, actually not pay back in full, for a period of, oh, in the area of six to nine months. But at the end of that time, uh, be able to de develop the cash to pay us back in full. Inflation has had a large role in changing our attitudes about money, but technology has provided the tool for our infatuation with credit. Without computers, says Hamelman, there simply would be no such thing as master charge. Computers make it possible to process the mountains of charges and payments that funnel through credit card processing centers. But as credit is available to more and more people, it is apparently being abused by more and more people. The Wall Street Journal reports that delinquencies and losses on master charge and visa loans have gone up 75% in the last couple of years. While delinquencies in Iowa are lower than in many parts of the country, Iowa Des Moines' Hamelman concedes that bank card losses are on the rise, and he blames the current economic situation. On the assumption that we do have a uh, recessionary environment, all forms of consumer lending are going to experience uh, increased delinquency. As far as the permanent effects, that will depend on the length of the recession and the depth of the recession. Now, if we have a recession that, that uh, uh, trends out to 
10, 11, 12 months, the effect can be much more serious on delinquencies. Right now, we think delinquencies are up. Uh, they're up slightly. And I think the, uh, the vote's still out as to how deep of a business cycle downturn we're going to get into. The vast majority of people who use credit cards never get into the kind of trouble that would bring them to the attention of collection departments or the credit bureau or the law. But a lot of people are uneasy about the way they use their credit cards. Do you ever use credit cards? Yes. Do you use them more or less than you wish you did? Uh, I use them a little more sometimes. Why do you do that? Uh, strictly sometimes because I don't have the money. Probably more than I wish I would. More or less? No, I, I use them when I need them. I don't think I use them more or less. I use them when I need them. I feel it's a convenience. You only have to write one check at the end of the month. You use credit cards? Yes. Do you use them more or less than you wish you did? About as much as we need to, I guess. We haven't gotten any trouble on them, so... Bobby Shook and Nancy Martins Bailey are counselors for the Committee on Criminal Justice in Ames. They spend a great deal of their time helping people who have been convicted of writing bad checks. Advertise, I, advertising really puts a pressure on, you know, you need this to be accepted in society, so a lot of times people overextend or... Gratification that's immediate. Yeah. Uh, buy now, pay later. Have now. Don't worry about paying. Uh, they're spending money that they think they're going to get before they have it. And then when it doesn't come in, then that sets everything that they've been doing that much in, in that much worse perspective. The people that Bailey and Shook see are extreme examples, but many of us now buy with credit those goods and services that have traditionally been bought with cash. Increasingly, I think we're seeing a shift of pe from people using credit only to purchase durable goods to a use of credit for current consumption, you know, to use it for gasoline, for your vacation. And in essence, you have nothing left except the bill. You find a person who goes to work, gets a paycheck, and they don't consider what debts they already have to pay, but they'll take that money and they'll buy what they want right now with no thought of what's come before or no thought of what's going to come after. That's a real trap. For folks who have fallen into the trap, the climb out is slow and difficult. Finding out where your money goes, that is the first step. You have to do that. Even when you've got bills that you can't pay, you've got to find out where your money's going. And then you have to set the priorities that you have in your unit, whether you're a single person or a person in a family unit. You've got to decide what is important and what must I pay. And you, you bite the bullet and tighten the belt, you know. All that uh, lovely stuff you do without. It probably is not going to be a short-term problem with a short-term solution. But over time, if a family can avoid incurring more debt, and if they do have a stable source of income, they can cut down on the flexible expenses and repay debts over time. That involves planning and carrying out a long-term plan, and that's not easy for many families to do. It's all very well if a family has set about to reduce its debts by planning and budgeting and doing without. But what if the creditors are not particularly patient or understanding? For the lending community, I feel very confident that, uh, in general, banks, uh, retailers, uh, what have you, are most interested in helping an individual and in understanding a situation and trying to uh, devise a payment schedule that will fit his current situation. It, does, it doesn't do us any good, nor does it do the consumer any good, to uh, simply ignore the fact. Something can be done if the consumer would come forward, say, I have a problem, and explain the problem. In many, many cases, we can help them out. A lot of people are just embarrassed to do that. Definitely, definitely. Um, I think they need to uh, overcome the embarrassment and uh, make the phone call. And I think they'll be, uh, uh, shall I say, pleasantly surprised. Twyla, is there any place people can go or having trouble with their debts to get professional help with the planning, budgeting, and dealing with creditors? Well, not right now, at least not in central Iowa. There used to be a nonprofit consumer credit counseling service in Des Moines, but it had to close its doors because it lost its United Way funding. Now, most of the people that we talk to feel that there is a need for some place like that where folks can go and for a nominal fee or no fee at all get some kind of professional help.
Charlene? Yeah. Twyla, you may have noticed that uh, football season has begun. I noticed. That brings us once again back to the subject of money, or more specifically, back to the subject of gambling. That's because sports gambling is one of America's biggest businesses. It's estimated that on last year's Super Bowl alone, Americans bet some 20 billion of their hard-earned dollars. And even more incredible than that is the fact that most of those bets were made illegally. It can be more exciting to watch a game if you've got a few dollars down on one of the teams, but whether you placed the bet with your local bookie or simply took part in the office football pool, if you placed that bet in Iowa, you were breaking the law. You are technically committing a serious misdemeanor, punishable by one year in, in prison or a $1,000 fine. Sounds pretty serious, but most law enforcement officials admit that millions of Americans here in Iowa and across the country are willing and able to take their chances. I think um, there are probably many dozens of bookmakers operating in Polk County, and I don't think it would take too much difficulty for anyone who seriously wants to place a bet to locate such a person. In addition, there are other uh, gambling operations, uh, d dice and illegal uh, poker games and things of this nature, which if you wanted to gamble, you could find it, and also the stakes could be very high. High-stakes games are illegal in this state, yet Wheeler says millions of dollars every day are gambled in Polk County alone. That's probably because most folks see gambling as a harmless activity. It's fun, it offers the possibility of getting something for nothing, and it's socially acceptable. Just take a look at many of America's heroes. They were all gamblers of some sort. They took risks, they played to win, and sometimes they even gambled with their lives. In fact, Americans tend to look down on those who play it safe, so gambling is for the most part accepted by the average citizen like the one who goes to the local pub for a drink and a friendly card game well it seems like some of the older guys in town this uh, tavern's been here for 40 some years there's nothing else for them to do and they'd come in and uh, they wanted to play cards in which cards was never allowed because of the gambling rules and regulations so i got a socially social gambling license to uh, allow them to, to play their cards and uh, bet, bet a beer on the pool table or uh, whatever. It gives them something to do. They enjoy it. Uh -huh. And I enjoy having them here. Mike paid $25 for his gambling permit. It allows his customers to do a little friendly betting as long as none of them win or lose more than $50 within a 24-hour period. For Mike and his regulars, it's more for fun than for profit. And there are other types of permits available that allow gambling for charitable purposes. But with any of these permits, there's always the potential for abuse. If I were to suddenly say, well, I want to open up a uh, number of bingo parlors and I'm going to give the money to charity, Who's going to guarantee I give it to charity other than say, well, I have a big overhead. I'm, I'm worth 100000 a year, and I, sh I should pay myself that salary. And if there's anything left over, I might give it to uh, some worthy cause. Wheeler admits that because of a lack of supervision, it's just as easy for bar owners to take advantage of the law. He says he knows of a number of places around town where there is more going on than Iowa's gambling laws allow. However, it took Wheeler almost a year to engineer a raid on the South Shore Club. Six people were arrested. The owner was found guilty of running a bookmaking operation. And just two weeks ago, Wheeler finally succeeded in getting the club's gambling permit revoked. But that was the first and only gambling bust in the history of Polk County. And Wheeler says it may be the last for a long time to come. So in spite of what you see in some TV shows, gambling raids like the one that took place in Des Moines are few and far between, possibly because of a lack of manpower, but more probably because of a lack of interest. Apparently, gambling in the eyes of the law, as well as in the eyes of the public, is often viewed as a victimless crime. Some officials say that's a lot of bunk and that gambling leads indirectly to more violent crimes. Wheeler stands somewhere in the middle, and although he doesn't think that a $2 bet will lead to murder, he does feel that more attention should be paid to illegal gambling. Just like uh, illegal um, prostitution, for example, I'm sure we'll never be able to wipe out prostitution. But on the other hand, if you totally ignored it, we would have a very... Um, you know, we'd have prostitutes all over the place. So we have to put some kind of pressure on there to put, keep it under control. 
As with prostitution, there's been for some time a move to legalize most forms of gambling throughout the country. But that prospect frightens a number of people for different reasons. Lawmakers often fight legalization on the grounds that it clears the way for organized crime to move in. But that concern is secondary for others who feel it makes gambling too accessible for folks who simply can't handle it. I think you're just opening up a whole new can of worms when, uh, when you promote it, you know. Uh, when the state of Iowa or the state of Nebraska or the United States says, hey, come everybody from the world, come to Las Vegas and gamble your money away, or come to Des Moines, Iowa and gamble your money away. Uh, I think that they're, they're asking for problems that they, that they don't have right now. One of those problems, as John Adams sees it, is what could be a drastic increase in the number of compulsive gamblers in this country. Five years ago, John was one of those people who played not to win, but to live. I was uh, the head basketball coach in a large high school. I had the pressures of winning and losing there. I had the pressures of can, who's going to start, uh, parents calling me, that kind of stuff. I had the pressures of paying bills at home and arguing with my wife, uh, uh, and I had the pressures of gambling, and the gambling was tremendous pressures because uh, that's what I lived for. That, uh, coaching was number one, gambling was number two, a very close number two, and um, they just kind of meshed in together, and uh, the, the, the time pressures, I was just, all the time I was working on it either a dog race book or the, uh, the horse track forms or football sheets, basketball sheets, hockey sheets, trying to figure out who was going to win or lose. Gambling often is linked to violence, especially if the gambler is having a hard time making good his bets. In the sting, it was handled in a lighthearted manner, but the point was still clear, pay or get hurt. These days, John says psychological violence has taken the place of broken bones and cement overshoes. You know, if you don't pay, they call you up at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, get you out of bed and say, hey, it's Thursday, you didn't come in and pay me. Okay, I'll be in tomorrow. Uh, you don't come in tomorrow, they call you up in the middle of the night and say, hey, you didn't come in. Or uh, Do you want me to call uh, where you work and uh, hit them up for the money you owe me? You know, they, they pressure you that way rather than... So we're back to the building up of the pressures again. Back to the pressures. The I always paid my bookie. <laughs> that was the first guy that got paid every month. Experts say that 20% of suicides in this country every year are gambling related, probably as a direct result of the pressures that John describes. Groups like Gamblers Anonymous now are trying to teach people how to deal with their compulsions, but they have a long way to go toward understanding the problem. And until they come to that understanding, John says he'd like to keep gambling laws from becoming more liberal. Uh, there are a lot of people that are compulsive over bingo. Uh, I go to Gamblers Anonymous groups uh, around different places, and there's a lot of women who play bingo, you know. Uh, other people play the stock market. Other people play the commodities market. Uh, people like myself played the football, you know. Uh, so all different kinds of people, and I, I think that, I don't think that laws have to be regulated toward these people, but I think the states that are changing the laws are better, better think about what they're doing. Actually, it doesn't look like Iowa's gambling laws will be changing in the near future. I talked with Senator George Kinley, who every year leads the fight for paramutual betting on horse racing here in the state. And he says, though he thinks his uh, bill will pass through subcommittee this time, he doesn't think it's quite going to make it on the floor of the legislature. Well, there's a lot of public opinion that favors horse racing in this state, but it looks like there's still a lot of problems to be ironed out. Yes, a lot of them. Bob? Up next, we'll visit two families, each with children and each with only one parent.
Parents, the word conjures up a pair of people. But more and more, parenting is being done by individuals on their own. This is the way the American family has been depicted for years, as one happy unit, with a mother, father, and one or more children, all living and working together in harmony. But as we know, that's not the way it always is. Today, more and more families are breaking up. Statistics show that almost one out of every three marriages end up in divorce. And if kids are involved in these breakups, which many times they are, they end up in the custody of either mom or dad, creating single parent families. I think at first was uh, the, the panic that set in uh, and adjusting to a single lifestyle after 20 years of marriage. Two years ago, Barbara Randall went through a divorce. After 20 years of marriage, she found herself on her own with two children, facing a number of new obstacles. I have had to change occupations uh, from a job that I, I was very satisfied in. That was a great job as a second income, but uh, to be a sole supporter of myself eventually, I could no longer you know, be a secretary, so I have had to, to change to a, a new occupation. Joining the full-time workforce wasn't the only problem Barbara faced. She also ran into difficulties with her married friends. It, it was quite a shock to me to have several married friends all of a sudden feel that when I was in, in their presence as a, a, a single female, to be treated as a threat to their marriage. But through all her troubles, Barbara's thankful she had her children beside her. I think, especially when the parent that has custody of the children, I, I really, at times they are a hassle because you go through such a panic, uh, you're going through such mixed emotions. But I do feel that they're a big comfort because you still have that part of your family to cling to and eventually you to be become closer to your children. Well, we do a lot of stuff together and we go a lot of places, like out to eat, a lot more than we used to. Barbara's just one of many people who are finding themselves in a single parent role. A recent government study shows that nationwide more than seven million families are headed by single women and a little over one million are headed up by men. <laughs> While there are many rewards to single parenting, there's also some drawbacks like giving up companionship. You're alone and I think there's a lot of support that comes from having um, a companion, at least if that person is um, one that you communicate well with. and. Uh, that can be very, very positive. So in, in giving up companionship, uh, you give up a lot of emotional support. At the same time, I think you give up a lot of time. Um, you have more things to do. You have to do all of the work, all the responsibilities related to the child are yours. You add the extra work. Um, you add uh, more responsibilities. Um, and you probably even add a feeling of needing to do a better job. To help them do a better job, many single parents are turning to a group called Parents Without Partners. This 10-year-old international organization has over 170,000 members, and that figure is growing every day. When my divorce was final and I had no friends, per se, due to the fact of the divorce, uh, I had to seek out new ways of uh, gaining new friends. And um, once you get desperate and seek out something, this is a great way to do it. Uh, Barbara Randall is the president of the Ames Chapter of Parents Without Partners. Current membership of the chapter includes more than 120 men and women from the Story County area. Their goal, to seek out for both them and their children, friendship, understanding, and most of all, companionship. Uh, I would think that Parents Without Partners would meet part of that need. They would supply a person with uh, some companionship. It would su um, supply a person with a support group, people who have experienced many of the same problems, who are experiencing many of the same problems. And 
all of us like to share our different concerns and problems that we have in our particular setting with people who have experienced similar sorts of things. There's more empathy. We sat in on a recent meeting of Parents Without Partners in an attempt to find out some of the major problems facing today's single parents. But I think that's a real fallacy because the people we need to reach the most in PWP are the ones who are joining us because they're hurting that's right. in some form or fashion. And I don't really think a lot of these people are really ready for the social that's, events. That's they're ready for it. And a lot of people have been married, so they've had married friends. And it's kind of a different lifestyle. And they're looking for somebody else that they can talk with, share, spend some time with. Because before I went into PWP, uh, I was very much kind of a loner. And, uh, it got me out, got me among people, and I think I've gotten closer to people than I ever have in my life. Yet uh, you with people that have gone through similar things, and uh, there's a bond, and it helps. Death and divorce aren't the only ways people become single parents. Nationwide, there's a growing number of men and women who have never been married that want to become parents, and they're doing it through adoption. Okay, let's make a birthday cake. Now get your bucket. And Virginia Hummel of Des Moines well, says she never thought any one saying. person could bring her so much happiness. She is talking about Annette, her five-year-old daughter. Virginia, who's never been married, decided she wanted to raise a child. So five years ago, she filed for adoption. I was 32 years old, and I was still single. And um, I did not have any, at least, immediate plans to get married. And I felt that uh, even if I should get married, that I might be too old to have, say, my own children. Because there is, after a certain age, a risk in having a baby. So I decided that I would apply for single adoption. Uh, one of the, the major things with Virginia was her strong support system. She has a lot of family and friends in town that are really supportive of her plans and are there when she needs help. Why is a strong support system so important? Well, for one thing, I think every parent needs time out from their children. And if, if they have a two-parent family, there's two of them that can take some of that burden. And with a single parent, they need outside help just for some time out or, or just for help with problems. Do you consider your life fuller and happier and richer because of Annette? Oh, I'm sure it is. There, there's more purpose. There's more goal. You know, there's, there's a more reason for, for being here and, and wanting, you know, to do things and that type of thing. Bob, how do kids fare in a single parent relationship? Well, Charlene, it all seems to depend on the individual. Some kids mm -hmm. thrive on it while others find it more difficult. But as it becomes more and more common, single parent families are finding the support they need. That's great. And that's Five Country Close Up for this evening. Join us again in two weeks. For Bob Pyle and Charlene Peroni, I'm Twyla Young. Good night. move fast so hurry supply is limited you asked for excitement you got it why aren't you driving a toyota test drive the exciting new celica mid-am at your nearby toyota dealers cool whip introduces the disappearing yogurt pie it's so delicious watch it disappear and so creamy watch it disappear and so easy you can make it in only five minutes. Just mix crushed fruit with fruited yogurt. Blend in Cool Whip non-dairy whip topping. Spoon into a ready-made graham cracker crust and freeze. Then... Watch it disappear! The Disappearing Yogurt Pie. A delicious dessert idea made with Cool Whip. Seiko introduces the world's first memory bank calendar watch. It shows the time, day, and date, can display any full month within an 80-year period, and even be pre-programmed to remind you of important dates in both the time mode and in the calendar mode.
the memory bank watch is only one of an incredibly sophisticated new digital quartz collection from Seiko. They're absolutely unforgettable. Seiko watches available at Zales. We now join the following program already in progress. in Nashville, Tennessee. It's that Nashville music. Brought to you by America's favorite dog food, Purina Dog Chow. 50 years of experience in every bag and complete nutrition in every delicious bite. So settle back for a big half hour of that Nashville music. This week starring Tommy Overstreet, Janie Freaky, and Jack Wherever you find animals, you'll find Purina. We make feeds for many animals. Ben may not know it, but a lot of Purina's experience is in our dog food. Purina dog chow. Now, when you pour dog chow out, hold it. Now, remember the 50 years of experience we pour in. Experience that helps the greyhound and the goat. Bulldogs and bunnies benefit, as do the shepherd and the sheep. So for a taste and nutrition experience, feed him the one with lots of experience. Purina dog chow. 50 years of experience in every bag. Now, here's Tommy Overstreet.